Greg Carpinello. I serve as the director of the Center for Faith and Justice here at Xavier University on campus, as Karen said, uh, originally from Loveland, Ohio, so one of the suburbs here in Cincinnati. Um, made my way down here in 1997 to start uh, attending classes in, as an undergraduate um, and graduated in 2001 and I uh, have been in Jesuit education ever since. So um, they've ruined me and sunk their claws into me and, uh, and I haven't left. But uh, uh, it's been a good journey for me. I'm excited to be here tonight to talk a little bit about uh, my own story of discernment. And I'll let Shannon uh, do a little bit more of an introduction and then say a few, a few more words of, of uh, introduction. We're just practicing turning our mics on and off in sync. Um, I'm Shannon Hughes, also so excited and um, happy to be with you here tonight. And I am an assistant director over at the Dorothy Day Center for Faith and Justice, like Greg. I grew up in Cincinnati and am a Xavier graduate back in 2007. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about the years in between as we get into my story, but uh, happy to be here and working with students. Our center, when, uh, when we were students, there was separate campus ministry and Dorothy Day Peace and Justice programs. And with the new construction and physical moving around, we also joined forces there, so we have students coming into our office who are um, looking for retreat programming, students coming into our office who are doing weekly service. We are just on the heels of spring break, so I um, was holding the emergency phone for the 180 students that were out across the world um, doing service and education work last week. And I'm happy to say that everyone is home safely with all of their <laughs> fingers and toes. <laughs> Great, uh, just a little bit more about um, our work in the Center for Faith and Justice, because I, I feel like it's relevant to what we're going to ask of you tonight. Um, part of our pedagogy is to really uh, get students involved and to, to actually get their hands dirty to do the work uh, of our Center of Deepening Spiritual Lives, Pursuing Justice, and Promoting Pluralism. And similarly, tonight, we're going to ask you to get your hands dirty with your own lives, with your um, what it is on your heart at this time of life, to think back and reflect on your own stories. Um, of your own uh, moments of discernment over the course of your journey. Like I said, um, we will tell our own stories and that's, uh, we do that on purpose um, and we do that in our work for a particular reason. Um, we feel like our personal stories are at times our best way of communicating the, the wisdom and insights that we've gained over the course uh, of, of our lives. And so instead of sort of um, preaching and, and didactically teaching our students about the things that we hope for them in their own lives, we tell our own stories and we ask good questions and we hope that they then, instead of focusing on our stories and the circumstances of those stories, they then reflect on their own lives. 
And then they then ask questions uh, similar to the ones that, that we've posed to them. Um, so that we're going to do that tonight. We're going to tell a little bit about our own uh, histories, Shannon and I will. Um, and so please uh, focus less on the particulars and the circumstances of our stories and pay attention more to the themes and the discernment uh, stories within those. Um, and you likely will have your own stories that will rise up and bubble up and resonate with you. And we, we ask you to kind of focus your energy and intention uh, and attention to, to those stories as well. The thing I'd like to just point out before we get started with, with that storytelling is that um, contrary to what uh, the culture might want you to believe, discernment, I don't think, is necessarily about decision making. Discernment, I think, is more about the ongoing uh, pattern in our lives of paying attention and reflecting and then responding to God uh, out of love. That, that if we're doing that continually, that is true discernment, not something that we just simply turn on when we have a choice A and choice B in front of us. And so in a lot of ways, I think discernment, uh, much with uh, a lot of the things in the spiritual life, have to do with t making practice, taking uh, time to practice um, these things. And so uh, I'm a, a sports guy, so I think immediately of baseball. You know, if, if, uh, if we were all just thrown into a game to field a ground ball uh, and we hadn't been practicing for months and years before that, uh, chances are we're not going to do that very well. And so it is with discernment. If, um, if we're paying attention and practicing, uh, being attentive to our lives, the movements of our hearts, how God is moving in our everyday, um, we'll be much well uh, better suited to, uh, to respond to those moments, those key moments, seminal moments of discernment that happen uh, occasionally throughout our lives when it is time to make a, a big choice one way or another. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Shannon. Uh, she's going to tell a little bit of her story, and then I'll chime in, and then we'll talk a little bit more about that process that I just spoke of. Thanks. So um, as Greg mentioned, when we started talking about this discernment, we wanted to offer something of ourselves. We wanted to come to you with some honesty and some of this story, but it was hard to say where is the moment that I can capture that I discerned, or what can I tell to you in a few minutes. Um, and so because it's difficult to choose that moment, maybe we can set the stage in, this first, um, in these first few minutes together. And my backstory of discerning leads me in one instance I think to a moment in April of 2012 and I'm not sure exactly where it begins so I think I would start with this space that we share um, all of you and Greg too th this uh, this Xavier space and Bellarmine space where I began my college journey I came in with a passion for my Catholic faith and was one of those who Father Overberg and beyond happily and intentionally disenchanted and befuddled and um, but then re-enchants readily with a new spirit accented with that distinct for and with others spirit and so I could spend a long time talking about the way that that felt to me and it was certainly a growing space but at the end of my four years I thought that I had matured and I had a new understanding of what I needed in order to fulfill me and it wasn't quite the same as what it had been before. I was graduating um, trusting that my next steps, which would be as a Jesuit volunteer in the Republic of the Marshall Islands, would help me solidify further this new faith and justice journey. Um, so heading into that space, I knew um, that I would be ruined for life. I knew that I had lived through one kind of turning upside down of the way of thinking and that this would be something that challenged me. But I would grow in my community and I would have spirituality nights and I would have people with me as I struggled and became this more full and complete person. Um, it was something that I think was praised here as a decision on campus. My peers knew what Jesuit volunteers were. It seemed like a good idea. It seemed like some a decision that other people admired. Um, and even though I was nervous, I thought it was the right thing to do. So I, I packed up and headed out for two years. And my time in the Marshall Islands really uh, 
<laughs> was different than what I expected. There was uh, certainly those same sort of community struggles that we prepare our students for today, where you remind everyone that nobody likes to do someone else's dishes. But more than that, as I was integrating into this community who had received Jesuit volunteers for almost 20 years, um, I started to feel a little bit uneasy about what we were doing. It seemed like in that space, I was teaching high school and living on the campus of a high school, elementary school, and parish kind of combination. Um, the, the, the school had become dependent on the volunteers, and I was 22 and graduating with my liberal arts education, um, teaching English, physics, and world religions, as well as <laughs> starting a college gu guidance course, um, trying to initiate a yearbook with students, running their fundraisers, and being there for their international dance nights. And while all of it was life-giving on one, in one level, my students were taking the SAT and the ACT. Students in the Marshall Islands could come to, to the United States for college as easily as anyone with United States citizenship. And so for me to recognize that without any teaching experience and without a single education class, I was standing in front of 12th graders who would be scored against folks who, like me, were graduating from Ursuline Academy in Cincinnati. Um, it didn't seem like I was a part of justice in that moment. I wasn't certain that I should be the one leading all of these students. And I wondered how we could invest in some of the teachers at the school who were Marshallese, and what would it take for them to feel supported enough to be there at school and to be the ones who were the role models in the after school and co-curricular programmings. Um, what would it take to build that community in a little bit? While I was questioning that work, even though I was still sending emails home and telling folks about this great journey um, and being supported and my, my friends and my parents and my grandparents were all so proud of what I was doing, um, my community was also struggling, and there were different issues there, but it started to feel less and less comfortable. And during my two years, the Jesuit presence also left. And in the transition away from a Jesuit priest that had known the community for 30 years, uh, a new priest came in from a much more theologically conservative order, sent 15 boys away to the seminary, immediately, um, and, and things started to feel different. He was using Catholic language that had been so meaningful to me in, in a way that was um, dividing our community, in a way that was not giving life to me, in a way that was kind of hard for the other volunteers and also for the community there to understand. And in all of that space, I wasn't quite sure how to continue to be fully spiritually present and engaged as well um, as doing my work. And so when I came back to Cincinnati at the end of those two years, I'll, I'll skip through some of the details, but just say that I w returned home and I was in need of this healing and this holding space. I wasn't sure if the new church I had found at Xavier was only here, or if I could connect to this identity in other places. I was upset at how the church was being used in other settings to manipulate people um, and manipulate whole cultures. So I couldn't do church like I had before. I appreciated the good work of many community development spaces here in Cincinnati, and I worked in Over the Rhine for OTR Community Housing for two years, and I felt the love of, of folks who were seeking justice in that space, and I made connections there, and I slowly made my way to Bellarmine as a parishioner and, and began to find that connection again. I um, joined a small faith sharing community here and spoke to folks who were at different stages of their lives and tried to make sense of that heart space again. Could, could this be my place? And, and 
still I wasn't sure if what I was doing in OTR would be my space. It was, again, something people said, this is good work. Um, but it wasn't, it was at the end of that two years in Over the Rhine, I was feeling my happiest. I was feeling nourished. I was feeling energized by this space. And um, I began to think that I could reintegrate faith into my justice work. So I decided um, to take a position as the manager of an education program that was connected to a Catholic social justice lobby. It sounded like a great marriage of my interests. I was ready to get back in, and I felt in this space and other spaces, I had begun to resonate with um, especially women religious, and um, this was a place that had been run by Catholic sisters for many years. So I decided that I would leave behind everything that had refilled me up and move to Washington, D.C. to give this new space a try. Um, and for those of you that haven't guessed, this was Network, which this Catholic social justice lobby. Um, and I worked there for a full year, getting to know these sisters who were seeking justice, who were lobbying Congress. I was visiting colleges and communities and talking about economic inequality and voting and Catholic social teaching in the public sphere. And um, in April of 2012, we celebrated our 40-year anniversary. And our lovely board of sisters um, whom, many of whom were well into their 60s and 70s, decided to throw a party and have a discussion with folks about how to get the word out about network. They said, we're doing good work, and when we talk to people, it resonates with them, or when we talk to young people, it resonates with them, but they don't know who we are, and, and the public doesn't know who we are. And so we brainstormed. We invited everyone to our 40th birthday party and brainstormed how to get the word out about the social justice work we were doing in DC. And four days later, we got a letter from the Pope, which <laughs> some of you may have heard about, um, explaining that this, this quest for justice was not quite what the Vatican meant, um, and that these particular ways of doing things were not inside the, the confines of the church, strictly speaking, and that the sisters probably needed some help getting back to where they ought to be. Um, for me, that was a very personal <laughs> moment. I was there with all of these sisters. Um, a, a friend of mine actually emailed the story to me and said, the, the subject line of the email was, this isn't going to be fun. And I carried this email over to my boss and said, I think we're in this press release. <laughs> and it was a story um, of, of the hierarchical church coming to our small organization of 10 people and saying, this isn't quite a fit. And what can we do to mold this back into shape? And for me, um, I say all of this not to criticize, but uh, in my personal journey, I wasn't sure what that meant. I had been on such a roller coaster with my Catholic faith that feeling that moment, um, I had, we had young folks from DC coming to our office and crying, young women saying, I'm not sure if this church is for me. And we had older um, nuns who were coming in and saying, well, maybe this has just been enough time. <laughs> And they were 80 years old and had entered when they were younger than 20, you know, ready to say, I'm not sure. But um, coming into that question, I felt like I was paying special attention to what was giving me life and where I was strengthened and where I was nourished. And so um, I don't want to take up more time, but that question is where I feel like many of my discerning practices came to life. Um, unlike Shannon, I think, um, well, it's a beautiful story, and, and you'll hear um, some more from Shannon uh, at the end of tonight's session. But uh, as I begin, I just want to point out that um, 
my story is one, and the one that I've chosen to tell at least, is one in which I didn't do any of that very well. <laughs> what Shannon just ended with, that sort of paying attention to movements and what, you know, all of that. Um, the story that I'm about to tell is one in which I, I didn't practice uh, discernment. And I want to choose uh, to tell it because I think it really sets the stage nicely, though, for what we hope uh, to, uh, to have you all think about uh, tonight uh, during our time together. Take a moment and think of um, something that you've uh, had in your life that you always dreamed of and then you finally achieved it or got it or it came uh, real for you. Um, think for a moment of, of what that might have been for you over the course of your journey. Something that you longed for, uh, dreamed about, and eventually realized. For me, I had this dream of working um, in the old campus ministry house that, that, um, that Shannon referenced earlier. It was a red brick house uh, that got paved, that got paved uh, for the, the, uh, the good word of progress uh, called Fenwick Hall. Um, and uh, you know, I was very much formed as a student here at Xavier uh, in very tangible, real ways. And so when I left to go work at the, uh, the Jesuit Spiritual Center out in Milford the year after I graduated, I always had in the back of my mind, what would it be like to come back and do that same kind of work for future Xavier students? And sure enough, um, I had that chance. And so I spent a year away after I graduated and came right back uh, for that dream job. And the first few years of that job were indeed a dream. I really uh, threw myself into that work and I loved every minute of it. It was more than I thought it would be. Uh, I loved working with students on retreats, um, helping them grow spiritually. I was growing spiritually, I felt, in those first few years. Um, everything was just uh, very rich with meaning, good relationships. I felt like I was making a difference in students' lives. All of that was going really well. After a while, though, I think I started to do all of that at a particular cost. Um, I feel like I started to do that at the cost of my sense of self. I started to take a little bit too much on. I think I attached myself a little too much to the work. I started to uh, make my identity a little too much embedded in what I was doing um, as my occupation. I even think now I can see that I tried to do everything myself uh, and I wasn't a very good teammate at the time. Halfway through my fourth year uh, in that dream job, um, I was confronted uh, one day by a coworker. It was uh, February, cold out, gray. Um, we had just gone through something as a team where um, I was kind of taking the reins on something, kind of following a pattern that had built up over years. Um, and this coworker, uh, gently but firmly confronted me. And I'll never forget our conversation. The gist of it was that um, she pointed out that I wasn't being very cooperative. And she said that it seemed like I was trying to do everything, uh, maybe not for the best of reasons, but maybe for my own self-promotion. It was a courageous act on her part, uh, in truth, um, to to sit me down and, and care enough about me to, uh, to share that feedback. I was young though and I was stunned by, um, by that, that confrontation, uh, as gentle as it was. Um, I listened, uh, but quickly after the conversation finished I bolted and um, I went off on my own and I spent the rest of the day um, on my own. I was really kind of stunned by it. I, I hadn't felt that level of honest feedback in a critical way in a really long time. Uh, and so, um, so I went away, and I went away by myself. And I, I sort of spent the day reeling, uh, in a sense. And um, the first few hours afterwards, and, and maybe you can relate to this after a similar situation, but I spent the first few hours kind of making up retorts in my mind. Oh, I wish I would have said this. or. Um, you know, well, I could have said this about the way that she was working in the office. Um, it was a lot of ego stuff going on in my head at the time. Thankfully, though, at some point in the day, something changed within me, uh, and I would call it grace because I didn't do anything uh, for this change to happen. But what changed was I finally settled down, I calmed down, and I was able to sit with her words. 
in a genuine, authentic way. And thankfully, I was able to do some fruitful, what I would like to call soul work. I spent uh, my evening uh, at Alt Park, which you all might be familiar with in the city. Um, and I brought along with me uh, a book by an author that, it was, that was really important to me at that time in my life, um, Richard Rohr, Cincinnati guy, you all might know, Franciscan priest who is out in New Mexico. And I took one of this book's thin one, if you've ever got a chance to read it, it's brilliant, it's called Everything Belongs. And something about that book, and something about that time, um, sitting with those coworkers' words, something about finally letting go of the, the knee-jerk reaction to all of her uh, comments to me when she confronted me. Something in that started a months-long process of discernment for me. And I think it was because that day I finally started to realize what maybe was obvious before but that I couldn't see. And that it was that I had devolved into some unhealthy habits, some ego-driven maneuvering in my work life. And when I was honest with myself, a sort of self-induced isolation from friends and family. So like I started with uh, this story, this first stage of discernment that, that was about to happen for me did not go very well. Um, I was living in Brockman Hall um, as part of my job here on campus. Um, and that was, that was a bad space for me to be in um, during these, these first few months, this first, what I would like to call the first stage of my discernment. And so even though I knew that my attachment to work meant that I was isolated from people in my life, isolated from friends and family, um, I unfortunately made the bad decisions to isolate myself further. Um, so I stayed in that room over there uh, for the next few months, and I was cloistered. I was kind of um, alone with just my overactive mind. Um, I wasn't reaching out to other people. Um, I knew that the important questions before me were these. I knew that the questions were, do I need to leave this job? Do I maybe even need to leave this city I'd never left before? And ultimately, did I need a completely fresh start? Those were bubbling up for me. But instead of pursuing those questions with a sort of spirit of authentic discernment or paying attention to the important things that Shannon said she was starting to pay attention to. Um, I unfortunately just stumbled my way through those first uh, few months, that first stage of discernment. And so it was characterized by um, being distracted by things, easily being distracted by um, things that were keeping me from the real questions at hand. Um, during that time, I think I was, um, I was sort of riddled with fear. Um, not knowing what the logical conclusions to those questions might mean uh, in my life and afraid of what that might mean. Um, an inability to be honest with myself. Um, I sort of reverted back to that knee-jerk reaction that I had had to my coworker, um, the sort of negative, uh, ego-driven reactions. And all of it together uh, meant that I was numb. I was sort of numb to what was going on uh, within me and numb to what, what might be uh, presented to me as an invitation. At the end of that first stage, I ended up just deciding to, to stay with the job, to come back for another year. Um, even though some opportunities had slowly started to present themselves during that time, coincidentally, uh, or not. So I, I decided, though, to, to just stay. There would ultimately be a next stage that I'll talk about in a little bit, but at first, uh, before we do that, we want to talk a little bit about this process of discernment. So we've kind of lay, set the stage for us all here, um, uh, and we want to talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts just for a few minutes before we give you some questions to think about for your own life. So getting into this process, um, we do, as Greg said, want to put this into your hands. And um, for me, that has given me a lot of life. So um, before we get to that, just thinking through the basics of discernment for me, and as Greg and I talked in preparation, I think has a lot to do with the way that we understand God, um, that God calls us into existence and, existence and 
dwells within us, but not just um, riding along, continues to, to work in our lives, and that there is a God who is at work in us, and that we can tune into and be present with. Uh, as Greg mentioned also, that discernment is not always about a decision. Um, it is, it's more fundamentally about paying attention, about reflection, about responding with love in an ongoing way. So in that way also discernment is about choosing between goods. Choosing between what's good and bad is about doing what's right. We all have to make those choices sometimes, but I think discernment's nuance is in choosing between goods and good things that are available and options to us. So it can be more difficult. Yeah, thank you. Just a couple of words about um, if, if we're good at paying attention to our lives, if, we've, if we're doing that on a daily, on a weekly basis. Um, there's a couple of things that I think uh, are important about this process of discernment. Um, that when we're choosing between goods, when we're trying to sift through all these feelings and emotions and experiences and voices in our lives, um, it's easy to recognize if we're honest with ourselves uh, that there's some, some conflicting spirits, there's some possibly negative patterns or negative movements that we need to pay particular attention to. And so um, this is coming straight out of, of, of St. Ignatius of Loyola. Um, but the marks of what, what he would call desolation um, uh, would be these and, and to be wary of when we're, when we're in this process of, of discerning spirits. Um, the first one is uh, inner compulsions of, of selfishness. And that is something that we, uh, by virtue of the fact of being human, can experience. Um, and another way I think uh, that I like to, to describe that would be our addictions. So we live in a society that, that is easy to become addicted to, to lots of things. Um, so what are our addictions? What are the things that happen within us that are sort of compulsive, that we're not sort of paying attention to on a daily basis, but that we're just doing and doing the motions and we're addicted to that? That would be a mark of desolation. The second one would be our ego or our pride. Um, how often um, do we sort of construct these images of ourselves to the outside world uh, in our daily lives, that we project a sense of ourself? Um, all of that is a reflection uh, that can be a reflection of just our ego, you know, our status, um, how we want other people to see us. The third one um, would be anger. Um, at one point in my life, I heard someone describe anger as simply sadness that is just beneath the surface of our lives and our heart, and I really liked that. Um, but if we're not in tune with what that sadness is and if it's manifesting itself in anger, then that can play uh, a part in, these, in this paying attention to our lives. If we're, if we're angry, uh, that, that could be a mark of desolation. The fourth one is greed. Um, another one that our culture, that we live in, our Western culture, uh, sort of cultivates in us the, the idea that we should, that we should pursue more, to, to uh, reach out and take more, um, that sense of greed, especially materially, and that can factor into our discernment in a negative way. The fifth one really resonates with me, and I'll talk about it a little bit later uh, as I finish up my story, but fearfulness. Um, what are the moments in our lives in which we're sort of paralyzed by fear? Um, when we cannot see beyond a certain question because of uh, the fear of the unknown or the fear of what we might lose or the fear of failure or the fear of what people might think of us if dot, dot, dot. The sixth one uh, that I'll share is self-doubt. Uh, again, another one that our culture is good at, uh, at cultivating in us uh, a sense of, well, I'm not good enough to do X, Y, or Z, or um, surely I'm not worthy enough of love, of fill in the blank. And the last one, um, I've talked a lot about cultural voices, but the last one that I'll share, uh, a mark of, I think, our desolation at times can be the voice of our consumer culture. You know, that voice that tells us, you know, if you just... If you just fill in, if you just buy this, or if you just get this, 
It might fill that void that you're feeling in your life. You know, a watch, a wardrobe, a car, um, what have you. So that voice of our consumer culture can be a mark of desolation for us when we can put our finger on it. On the flip side of all those seven, I think are a really wonderful uh, paradigm though. Um, and this too comes from St. Ignatius, but he talks about seven attitudes that, um, that are required for authentic discernment. And they sort of, um, they sort of negate all of these, these, uh, these seven marks of desolation and they're really rich and they're really beautiful. So for authentic discernment, if we, um, if we go into it with a spirit of openness, that can be um, a sign of authentic discernment. So an openness where we sort of relinquish our attachments. I, atta I, I talked uh, a little bit in my story about that attachment to work that I had wrapped up uh, so much of my self uh, identity in my work. Um, I wasn't able to enter into my original stage of discernment because I wasn't letting go of that, that attachment. And I was so attached to that particular way of being in my life. So if we go into it with openness. Secondly, if we go into it with a spirit of, of generosity. So oftentimes, um, I know in my own life, uh, discernment can start off by saying, well, I'd be open to this except for that. I'd be open to it except for if it meant this. But truly what we're called to is a sense of uh, generosity where we're willing that prayer that we started with tonight was beautiful and says it much better than I can but if we enter into discernment saying you know what everything I put everything out there on the table and I'm willing to engage and and enter in with a spirit of generosity of giving myself completely to this this process that's what we're called to Courage would be the third one, uh, and this is one that, uh, that is a, an exact opposite to the fear, to the fear that can paralyze us. But if we go into it with a courageous sense of, um, of being willing to entertain things and choices in our lives, even when we know on the other end there might be difficulty, or there might be heartache, or there might be some suffering, but that courage um, to do ultimately uh, what we're called to do, then we can have an authentic discernment process. Fourth, um, interior freedom. Uh, again, that sense of, of inner space, of feeling like we're free to choose uh, in, in the situation that, we're, that we've let go of the things that sort of enslave us uh, in our lives and that can creep into our discernment processes. Number six, a habit of prayerful reflection. And so the way that we like to think about this in our center is, uh, is simply to be always engaged in the process of being attentive to our lives, reflective, asking good questions about what we're, what we're noticing in our lives, and then ultimately choosing love through all of that. Lastly, the last two things I would say is that uh, authentic discernment calls us into communion with God. That that's the ultimate desire for discernment, that we be uh, more aligned, more closely aligned with God working in our hearts and in our world and within ourselves and within our communities. And that's what authentic discernment beckons us towards and calls us towards. And then lastly, um, I would say that authentic discernment uh, is not confusing ends with means. That again, the most important part is the process that we engage. Uh, not for me whether or not I stayed with my job or I left my job, but ultimately the more important thing uh, is how do I engage that process? How do I communicate? How am I in tune with God uh, throughout that process? And the ends will work themselves out, but ultimately uh, the means are the most important part. So if we pay attention to those um, sort of marks that Greg was talking about of desolation and we pay attention also to the marks of consolation, then, then we are in the gathering phase of discernment. We're collecting clues about the spirit moving within us and, um, and, that, and that moves us then to take a step to, uh, to move toward 
whether it's a decision or simply a step in a, sing in a direction different than we've taken before. But after that initial movement, we seek confirmation. So um, sometimes it's not a bolt of lightning, but <laughs> it is um, sometimes rational or more effective. But no matter what we seek, some confirmation that this decision is nourishing to us, that the space we've moved into s continues to fit and answers that question and the, the call that we feel. And I would just say finally, as you're carrying all of that and paying attention to the clues within yourself and in your life and you're seeking confirmation along the way for those steps that you're making, that discernment in that way feels much more like being led than leading and that if nothing excites or beckons you from the space where you are then maybe you return to the beginning of God is at work within me and if I sit quietly I will be called to something I will um, be of use and you can return to number five uh, the attitudes the seven attitudes from Saint Ignatius that really lead us to these rich places of discerning. For me, um, a lot of this training for me also came from St. Ignatius and here in this Jesuit space. And it's exciting to then find other spaces where, where that same practice is happening. And we wanted to use some of your time tonight to give you a deep breath or a moment where you are allowed some time to look for those clues in yourself and in this space. So I have a couple of questions on a handout I'll share with you in a moment. Um, at the bottom are the marks of desolation and the marks of consolation that we've been talking about. And I would hope that you would read the questions, allow yourself to be led by them um, as it makes sense for you. But we'll take a couple of moments just to quietly um, consider these questions that are actually taken from um, a practice of the Sisters of St. Joseph and um, are used in a process that they call the sharing, the state of the heart and the order of the house. So since we're here together, I thought we'll do some personal discerning. Um, we often think of this as very particular to me. Obviously, with all of, all of the inner workings, it is a personal thing, but um, we are, we're here as a community, and so this process that I pulled from is, in the words of the sisters, a tool to listen for the movement of the spirit within the community. It can help us discern in an ongoing manner if we are being faithful to the mission. And um, so they use a little bit um, of different language than I was used to encountering in the Jesuits. They talk about the dear neighbor and being called to come into community with the dear neighbor, which is everyone around them, and bringing people closer together and everyone closer to God in this process. Um, so we, we've adapted it a little bit for tonight, and certainly um, I would be willing to bet that Bellarmine as a parish has discerned its way of being through a communal process of listening to each other and, and similarly moved then um, toward their mission. So the goal of tonight is not necessarily to set a direction or determine next steps for that community, though um, it sounds like at the end of even the Lenten discussion, you all will be talking about some next steps. Uh, we just hope to offer you a moment to consider what discernment means in your life. And so in this individual remembering, reflecting, considering the current movements of our lives, um, we'll be present to each other. So having taken that individual time, we'll gather in small groups. So if um, when we let you know that the individual time is up, if you want to move close to maybe groups of three or four, um, and we will allow some of our story to be received reverently, without critique or judgment or comment. So in that space, rather than having a conversation, um, we'll focus on sharing from the heart. I would encourage you to be, um, to be honest and um, 
take whatever steps toward vulnerability you feel that you can. This is held in confidentiality. And um, that then we would listen to each other and offer that gift of presence. So um, we hope that in this sharing we would have a greater awareness of God's activity in the world and a fuller responsiveness to the stirring of that spirit and our own ability to be a word or an act of God in our time. So um, right now we'll pass around these sheets and take a few moments to read the questions on the front side that says the practice of discernment and um, consider what the sisters call works of zeal any encounter or experience or event of our lives in relation to any creature, including ourselves. So um, we'll call you back when it's time for small groups. Thank you all so much for sharing and being in groups uh, together. I think for me, the story that I started was a question of how to find my space in church and how to um, be, continue to be enriched by my Catholic identity and all that had nourished me um, as I grew up and, and now returning to Cincinnati. And in some ways, you all have been part of the answer tonight. Um, I think that when there are spaces for all of our voices and when I listen to other people who are asking difficult questions and when I listen to other folks who are making sense of the church and who are enriched and who are in love but who are also in that struggle, um, all of that is a piece of where I find my marks of consolation. And so I think even in my struggles and questions, um, in moments where I have removed myself from it, uh, it is, it's more of the ego and it's, it has less to do with the life-giving elements that we see on that consolation side. So I would thank all of you for being a part of what consoles me tonight and um, let Greg maybe wrap up with the end or the end of his um, discernment story before we hear from you all. Thanks. <clears throat> Earlier I had said that uh, my first stage of discernment had ended uh, by just deciding to, to continue on in, in the current role or the, the, the role that I was in at that time in my life. Um, but a funny thing happened and I think God continued to work within me. What a novel concept, right? <laughs> that God kept working. Um, and little did I know it then, but it was just the first stage. I thought it was over. I thought I had made my decision. Um, but what I had ahead of me was a few things. I had um, some time off from work. What an amazing thing that can be uh, for all of us. I was on a 10-month contract here in my position at Xavier. And um, during that two-month break that I had, uh, I had a couple of things planned. I had a drive uh, across country. Um, that I'd always wanted to do. 
Uh, I had that planned. I had a retreat in New Mexico with uh, Richard Rohr, who I spoke of earlier, uh, planned as well. And then I also had um, the continuation of my studies at Boston College. I was pursuing a master's degree in pastoral ministry at the time at Boston College. And so I had all of those things um, lined up for me. And it was very clear once I hit the road and started driving across country to head down to New Mexico, um, it was very clear right away that the decision that I had made to stay was probably pre premature, that I had just this, this, uh, this sense very early on that I wasn't done with that decision and that there was more to, to pay attention to. Again, because I don't think I did things quite right in that first stage. I don't think I was quite paying attention and reflecting and, and responding with love in all the right ways uh, in that first stage. Once I got to that retreat in New Mexico, um, I, was, I was moved uh, to really start to put my finger on my own heart uh, in a new way and recognize how deeply I had been motivated by fear in my life, not just with this particular decision that had led me to stay uh, with my current role um, at Xavier, but uh, that oh, I started going back through all sorts of relationships and decisions and chapters of my life uh, in which I wasn't making terrible choices. Um, you know, I was surviving. I was doing quite well in a lot of ways. But I started to notice how big of uh, a thread of fear was woven throughout um, a lot of those stories. So I put my finger on that for the first time and kind of owned up to that for the first time in my life uh, on that retreat. And then ultimately I made my way all the way out to Boston College that summer to, per, to continue my studies. Um, and, and some more funny things kept happening and God kept working. Um, and new relationships and new opportunities um, and new dynamics started to present themselves in my life. And for the first time, I took a second to truly listen to what those were um, and truly start to bring all of these questions that I had sort of distracted myself from in the first stage of discernment. Discernment, I don't even know if it was true discernment. Um, without, and so in this new, this new stage that I entered into, you know, I let those distractions go and I started entering into uh, some better practices, right? Um, so I started fielding the ground balls a little bit better. Um, I started to, they have this beautiful labyrinth up there at Boston College uh, and I started walking that daily. Um, and that became a really rich prayer practice for me at that time in my life, uh, a time when I could really enter into conversation with God about what I was feeling, um, to talk about that fear uh, that had paralyzed me, that maybe kept me from some decisions that maybe I needed to make in my life. Uh, so opening up my, my heart to that uh, to God's voice, to all of these new possibilities. I started feeling that sense of interior freedom. I started to feel this sense of courage in my life in a new way. And eventually, um, I started to take steps that I knew would ultimately lead to some heartache and some suffering. Um, I started to take some steps in my life that meant uh, leaving the job that I had always considered to be my dream job. I started to take that step towards accepting a new life uh, in Boston um, uh, because of an opportunity up there. Uh, but that meant that I'd leave my, my family and my friends uh, in Cincinnati, the, the only city that I had ever known. So all of that was a... Um, you know, as I was afraid, uh, but I found a sense of courage to move through that, uh, knowing that I would miss home, knowing that I would miss the job, knowing that I didn't know what the new life ahead of me was really going to hold. Um, but I found the courage uh, to choose that. So for me, though, the most important thing that I took away from it was not the actual decision that I ended up coming to, the decision to leave, the decision to start anew in Boston, um, because I very well could have come back here and, and come back to the job at Xavier at that time in my life. Um, but the process was so important. The process of being in tune with the movements of my heart. Uh, the process of identifying those, those marks of consolation and those marks of desolation. Those were so, uh, that was such a crucial process for me and one in which I was able to carry on uh, with multiple things in my life uh, after that point. 
And ultimately, uh, my journey has led uh, back here as we started with earlier. Um, and so, you know, you can always come home again. Um, but the process that I went through to get to those points was crucial. At this point, that's sort of all we have prepared. Um, we'd like to open it up now for just maybe a minute or two of um, thoughts or insights or questions or um, your own pieces of your own conversation that, that uh, seem to resonate with all of you. Um, if there's anything there, now might be a time to voice it. And, and if not, we can just simply end in prayer too. But uh, we wanted to leave some space for you. Remind me that um, it's messy. I mean, you know, and, and all of our lives are sort of messy, and and rarely is it so clear cut. You know, that choice A, choice B, choice A is what I'm going to go with. It's, you know, it's so complicated. Um, you know, when we, when we when we pull in, you know, the the, the heart, the heart's a powerful thing, um, but our culture is a powerful thing, and our mind's a powerful thing too. I mean, I think that's been a mark of my own journey is having to, you know, to remind myself that this could be just my mind <laughs> taking me somewhere and I need to get in touch with other ways of knowing in my life. Um, that's been really important. I would thank you also for sharing and think, agreed, that it is messy. And both of us spoke, um, Greg talked about Richard Rohr and reading, but also going on retreats. And for me, it's been so valuable to have, um, at times it was different, communities of sisters or individuals in my life who I thought at least I could take those questions to. And um, whether it was returning to a reading or going to a person and saying, you seem like you've made some choices and can I be with you while I'm wading through this? And so I'm grateful to be among all of you who are also in those conversations. <laughs> 